All right, so we have our two complete dishes here. Fat Malahi, popular in Ramadan in Gaza and Palestine. Beautiful shrimp stew, zibdiyat gambari. Both of these dishes kind of showcase the use of the zibdiyat, basically ubiquitous uh, throughout the Gaza Strip. Gaza, a place of immeasurable resilience, the beating heart of Palestine, and you know what else is often overlooked when it comes to Gaza? It's cuisine. If you know anything about food in Gaza, you know it can be spicy. For this episode of Turning Tables, Palestinian Cooking with a Twist, I had the honor of learning from the Gaza mom herself, Leila Haddad, a fellow journalist, a public speaker, and the co-author of the Gaza Kitchen. Together we whipped up two dishes with a traditional zibdi also known as the mortar and pestle. First, a zesty Ramadan salad known as Fat Malahi. And another trademark of the Gaza kitchen, Zibdiyat Gembari, a scrumptious shrimpy stew that's simply delicious. Honestly fam, I still can't believe I had to watch this whole thing being made through a computer screen and miss out on the chance to taste and smell it. But such is life in a pandemic, and I'm sure someone somewhere is working on that technology. Yeah, let's get to cooking. Tell me, what are we making today and, and why are we making? Yeah, di so dishes. So we oh. are going to be making two things that sort of showcase the use of this, which is called a zibdiya in Gaza. And it's essentially an unglazed clay uh, mortar, right? With a lemon wood pestle. And this is ubiquitous throughout Gaza. It's um, used in prepping ingredients, serving them, uh, cooking in, in them as well, and they come in different so shapes and sizes. But it's sort of synonymous with uh, food of Gaza, with the cuisine of Gaza. And you won't really see it being used, um, and it's not widely available outside of Gaza. Uh, well, so I was just going to say, you know, I have no idea what that is. I mean, I've seen something similar, but even the name, Al Ism, I didn't know that. And I'm right, exactly, exactly. And we're going to go with the flow. Absolutely. Basically. So we're going to start by chopping uh, a couple of, of I'm going to use jalapenos. But um, Ooh, definitely use, yeah. So in Gaza, there's a very specific kind of hot pepper that's only, you know, I guess only grows there. But I would say the closest pepper in terms of the heat index would be jalapeno or, or a serrano pepper, but don't use like uh, Thai chilies or anything like that. So I'm just gonna, you know, dice them up and, you know, they have these thick white membranes. So just get, I get rid of those because it's gonna leave kind of a bitter taste. You can leave some of the seeds in depending on how hot you like this. Uh, okay. If you happen to not like things hot, then feel free to omit these or, you know, substitute something that's more mild, like a poblano pepper. Okay, so I'm just kind of giving that a, a dice. And always when you're using the zibdiya, and by the way, you can substitute any mortar and pestle with a sort of rough interior, like a granite mortar and pestle. I think I I had one lying around here somewhere to show you. Just don't use like um, anything smooth because you won't get a, a good grind or, or whatever on that. People have asked me, can we use like a food processor? And eh, I would rather you just use, you know, a big like chef's knife rather than a food processor because I feel like it really mushes things. It doesn't really. Yeah. Is that more of like a texture thing or it's because the exactly. taste is well, dependent on the texture, arguably. That's what my. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I mean, I, I sometimes say, you know, and if you don't have, if you really don't have any of these things use like a stone like just get a stone and use that i mean it works you know on a board i would rather you do that than use a food processor that's how strongly i feel about <laughs> you know mortars and pestles so i'm just going to add a little bit of salt in the um in the zibdiya and what that does is it just helps it gives some friction when you're when you're mashing the peppers mm -hmm. and we often you know we'll begin sometimes for other recipes mashing garlic in here or dried dill seeds so it's always the same idea you begin with a little salt and then, you know, you're just going to give it um, a nice mash. And my my uh, grandmother, even though she hated cooking, you know, would always tell me one thing. She would say, whenever you're using a zibdi or any mortar and pestle, you have to put some muscle into it. She was yeah. like, don't pound like a wimp. She would say, like, <laughs> hold it down firmly with one hand and, like, put some muscle into it, you know? And That's she's strong like, Palestinian woman oh, insisting on yeah. strength. I'm, I'm all for that. Yeah, there was definitely no like tender loving moments in the kitchen. <laughs> this specific one that we're preparing is called fat malahi. And fat, you know, it's a it's a word that's used to describe 
uh, several, a range of dishes, I would say, throughout the Levant, um, in which pieces of leftover bread are, right. you know, uh, torn apart and, and fit means to kind of like mix, mix in, mix right? Mix it all up in there, right. Yeah, exactly. And so there's like fat, you know, bitinjan, like eggplant feta, there's... I like all feta, anything, just, you know. Exactly, exactly. Chicken, yogurt. Right, and so this is fat malahi, and malahi or malaha uh, is an old word used to refer to like sailors, and so this is kind of like a leftover bread salad type thing. That's probably the best way to describe it, right? So again, you're just gonna give it a nice mash, so you're not getting big chunks of, you know, searingly hot peppers. And um, so I just mashed it down like that, and now I'm just gonna add, and you just proceed to add all of the different uh, ingredients for this. We're going to add some green onions. And again, if you just happen not to have one of these things, no big deal. I, I yeah. put those in everything, by the way. And I think it's because my mom does that too. And and I know some of her friends complain and know it's overpowering. It ruins the taste. But I think it's spicy yeah, enough. It's because the things that I grew up eating, you know, mainly because my dad and mom, you know, again, they love, they always had to have a side of like raw chilies and onions. Would you believe me, Leila, if I told you my mouth is starting to salivate slightly? Oh, yeah. Well, I tell you, there's something also about about yeah. India and clay cooking in general, but right. also being able to play with your food, I think, and again, sort of the, you know, all the sensory impact of being able to mash and, and so forth, it um, takes it to a whole new level. So, all right, so I'm going to add a cucumber, and usually if you're making a bigger quantity, you would double or triple these. I'm just making sort of a, a smaller Small. quantity. Yeah, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna dice this. So I just added the the cucumber in there, and I'm gonna add a chopped tomato. You know, I've never been I've been to the the West Bank, but I've never been physically in Gaza. But all the Ghazawi people I meet all over the world, like obviously beyond the pride, there's this very like um, diverse sort of. You know, because everyone came from different places, but then they became this, you know, in this one confined, relatively small place. So I would just imagine that it's bustling with the culture oh, of absolutely. Palestine from all over. Yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? Beyond even food, but I would imagine the food is... Oh, you know, and people are very, are very, like, you know, they proud and uh, of where they're from and, and they show exactly. that. The Maybe the most that, proud. I would say. Yeah, and I found that fascinating. That was really interesting that, that the people who did make this, the several people that I talked to were so passionate about it. Like, this is amazing. You know, we can't have a single day in Ramadan. It's the second most important ritual following prayer in Ramadan. That's how strongly they felt about it. So I was like, okay, so I got to include this. So it was more of sort of a Whatever you want to call it, you know. Um, and it looks like it's an incredibly tasty dish on oh, the for side. Sure, for sure, for sure. And it was also partly like my ethnographic interest in like making sure I document all of these really sort of obscure, much loved recipes. Yeah. And by the way, I'm adding basil now. And to, so you see, I've mashed all the ingredients together the tomatoes, mm. the peppers, the cucumber, the green onions. And so now I'm adding fresh basil. And basil is one of those. And I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm rolling them up tightly. I just find that easiest. And then you can kind of, um, you know, uh, cut them into little strips like this. So what I'm going to do next is yeah. uh, just cut the lemons, squeeze the lemon juice and mix it with a little bit of uh, tina, sesame seed paste. And in Gaza, there's a very specific variety of tina that is in Arabic, it's called tina hamra and it translates to red tina, but it looks more of like sort of a dark, like deep brown tina. And what they do differently is they roast the sesame seeds before they press them uh, rather than steam them. And it has this really sort of rich, nutty quality to it that's unrivaled. So what I do is I add a little bit of toasted sesame oil to it, to regular tina, and that gives it that same kind of like deep nuttiness. And then I'm going to mix that with the lemon juice and uh, mix that into the salad along with the toasted bread and then everything kind of come together. So that's what I'm about to do next. I love those little secrets, though, about like the sesame seeds being roasted. I keep hearing these sort of anecdotes when I ask my grandma or my mom for recipes. Right. And well, we're so it's those tiny food. things. Yeah, we are. But the, the, those tiny things make this subtle difference in taste that everyone responds oh, yeah. to. You know? So this is basically the roasted sesame oil. I just got it at a local uh, Korean mart. You can find it, I think, in other places as well. But if you smell it, it has that really, you know, rich, mm. um, 
a nutty taste I was talking about. So I'm just going to mix it into the tina that I have, and it will impart that kind of similar flavor that the red tina um, that you can find in Gaza has. And I'm just going to mix everything together, and it will quickly thicken. Um, don't get alarmed because when we mix this into the salad, the the juices from the the tomato and everything else in there is going to thin it out. So it should be kind of on the thicker side. It shouldn't be the way that um, most tena sauces you might be accustomed to seeing are very thin. So mm. don't worry about that for now. This is kind of on the thicker side. And now what I'm going to do is um, take this piece of uh, bread. You know, you could really use honestly any kind. Obviously, this is kmaj or uh, more commonly known as pita bread, Arabic bread. I just had a, a half of a round that was left over from breakfast. I toasted it and, you know, just break that apart like that and then just throw that into your salad. This is something fun that the kids can do, you know, <laughs> if you have kids running around the kitchen, as I frequently do. So That's the part I would trust myself with. <laughs> this that's it right that's the just the bread part maybe okay. sneak a few pieces and so i just added the bread in there and you know mix that in it will soften pretty quickly and that's the reason we toast it because if you just mm -hmm. put in like untoasted bread it'll get soggy pretty quickly but this kind of allows it to retain its structure you know the integrity of the, of the bread itself without getting too mushy and then finally we're just going to add in the tina mm. And it's gotten kind of thick, as you can see. But you'll see as we mix everything together, mm. it's, gonna, it's gonna thin out because of all the juices from that tomato. It was a really juicy tomato. So, uh, but then taste it. And if you feel like it needs more- I want to, I can't, it's virtual. <laughs> I know, I know, right? If only, maybe that's the next, the future. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna drizzle the top uh, generously with olive oil. And this is something that we do with a lot of other salads in Gaza as well, including the dagga. And that just helps cut a little bit of the, the peppery bite, right? And so mm. I fizzle the top with olive oil. And we're just going to garnish it with some, um, I love these olives. Mm. Um, they're just so big and juicy. But from with these olives, a little, just pit them. I mean, I'm just pitting them roughly. We just put a little on each side. And then some fresh radishes. And if you have any pickled peppers, I just happen to be out. So yeah, just throw some radishes on there. And then if you have any um, pickled peppers, you can put those on as well. And so that's, so like that's it, yeah, so. This okay. one done. Okay. On to the, so, on to the next. The, over here for a second. Yeah, yeah. Put it away from the screen so that I don't keep oh. salivating. Otherwise, <laughs> dish number two. So dish number two is zibdit gambari, which essentially translates to shrimps in a clay pot or clay bowl and again the zidiya being the clay mortar that we just used to make fatma so it's essentially a shrimp stew that's uh pretty popular in gaza in the urban areas as well as amongst the uh, refugees that came from yafa nearby gaza so there's hope for me to make two two dishes one that you're sharing with us one day maybe not today but um, I love shrimp, and my grandfather's from Yaffa, and cool. even though they didn't end up in Gaza, he loves shrimp too. I don't know if there's a connection. Maybe he just happens to love shrimp. Yeah. Um, but what do you love most about this dish? Well, I love how quickly it comes together. I love how flavorful it is. The Gaza is synonymous with seafood. Um, it's the only part of the Palestinian territories, um, sort of in the modern sense, that has direct access to the coast, limited as that might be, obviously, which is, I think, only... Um, something like eight to twelve nautical miles that fishermen can. Yeah. Allow. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to dice this onion. So, so and ahead. then we'll just talk while you dice. Okay. So step one: dice the onion, and oh. then ignore Ahmed's annoying questions. I'm just apparently like dicing here it the peppers. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So first the onion, then the peppers. I love how you fold it in there when you're chopping. I'm just observing you. You're oh. folding. It's. I just find it easy. Well, this is a very. I'm kind of annoyed. I couldn't find a good bunch of dill. So we use a lot of dill in Gaza, both fresh and dill seeds. Okay, so what I'm doing is kind of chopping everything so that we have it ready before we proceed with the recipe, which is started on the stove top, finished in the oven in the clay bowl. So I just chopped the chili peppers, the onion, I have the um, dill greens here, and then I'm gonna um, slice a few cloves of garlic. Ordinarily in a lot of the recipes, garlic is mashed in the zibdiya. 
um, with some salt. But in this case, in this particular recipe, we're just going to kind of quickly mash it with the back of our knife and then slice it. You know, that, that thing you're doing with the garlic is the only thing I learned from my mother when it comes to how to prepare Palestinian. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that, just that simple how to get makes me feel like I know what I'm doing in the kitchen. Oh, I don't know how you're multitasking. I, I guess you're super mother Palestinian. <laughs> yeah, I know. You get used to it when I'm just, what I'm going to do is um, I'm just going to mash the uh, the chili peppers a little bit with some salt. And basically, Omar Madan told me you should just use your fingers and kind of rub these things together like this. And um, you get the sort of the fragrance of the dill there mixed in with the garlic. So you're just going to kind of mix together, rub together the garlic and the dill, and then set that mm -hmm. aside. And I'm just kind of prepping all the ingredients so that when we get going, we have them all ready. So basically, you get everything ready and then you cook it in one pot after you fry the shrimp. Right. So you get everything ready. And what you, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by pan, by dry, what I call sort of dry sauteing the shrimp. So what I've done is I have, I want to say about, you know, a kilogram, but the, you know, you could make it less two pounds of shrimp that I, I like to use wild um, shrimp that's already been cleaned and deveined because with four kids, um, you know, roaming around, I don't have the time to sit there. And, but if you, if shelling and deveining shrimp is your thing, knock yourself out, you know. But um, I, I always advise definitely don't get pre-cooked shrimp. I know they sell that sometimes. <laughs> if you can, avoid farmed shrimp. Um, but again, do what you must. And then you don't need really big shrimps or prawns for this. In fact, the ideal size is the smaller size, kind of like this, because they're-, they're I gonna... always like smaller shrimps. I don't right. know, people make fun of like, me. Yeah, you're not grilling the shrimp, they're gonna be mixed into a stew, and you don't want these huge chunks of shrimp when, you're, when your guests are eating, right? I'm gonna start by dry frying, as I say, the shrimp that's already been cleaned and deveined in a skillet. And basically, that's just gonna, we're gonna do that for about two minutes until it turns pink and it releases some of its juices and we're gonna discard those juices, strain them and then set the shrimp aside. So that okay. should just take about two minutes. And that's somewhat different, I think, than what a lot of people are accustomed to doing with shrimp or how they're cooking with shrimp, which is usually in a lot of Western recipes, it's added in towards the end, right? Got okay. it. How long approximately does the shrimp cook for? Just two to three minutes. You don't really want to okay. cook them. You just want them to kind of just turn barely pink and release, uh, you know, um, some of the water. You see it's already coming out of the pan like that. And then what we're going to do is just strain the shrimp and then um, proceed with the recipe. Okay, so this is pretty much done. It's released some more of that liquid. So I'm going to go ahead and strain it in the same pan that I used to dry pan drop fry that shrimp I'm gonna add uh, some olive oil and I'm gonna saute the onion until it's tender so I'm gonna add that onion I chopped mm. so I'm just again getting that nice and tender and then I'm gonna next add the um, peppers that we mashed and this quickly, this part comes together quickly. So now you're not leaving it for a long time on the pan. You're just kind of barely cooking through these ingredients and it's going to finish cooking in the oven, which I've already preheated, by the way, to 375. So I'm adding those mashed peppers, the dill, the, the uh, chopped dill and the garlic as well. All right, and then next I'm going to add a couple of tablespoons of tomato paste. And I like to use, again, a jarred, we have a lot of Turkish brands around here, but I find that they're superior, like a nice, a jarred tomato paste preserves the flavor really well. And we use a lot of tomato paste, I would say generally in like Arab cuisine, it helps to thicken stews and, and give it kind of a, a deeper, richer um, flavor. And when you, when you um, saute the tomato paste a little bit, it um, amplifies the flavor, but you know you caramelize it a tiny bit. So, so we're just mixing all that together. Give it a quick stir, and then next we are going to add the spices and give those a quick stir as well. And okay. 
The spices that I've included here are salt and pepper, of course, cumin, ground cumin, everything is ground. So cumin, coriander, a little bit of cardamom and allspice. So it's a nice, very fragrant mixture and it goes really, you know, well with the uh, shrimp. And so giving those a quick stir again, just brings out the flavors of the spices a little bit more. So next we are going to add the tomatoes. And as I said, if you happen to have, you know, an abundance of fresh and seasonal tomatoes, by all means use those. You would just need to kind of plunk them in some hot water, peel them, dice them. It's a good way to use, you know, a bumper crop of tomatoes. And if you don't, these jarred tomatoes make a wonderful substitute. So I'm just using crushed tomatoes. You can use the petite diced tomatoes. And I'm just gonna add in here on top of everything that we've been frying. Mm, the sizzling sounds. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna let everything kind of cook through for a minute or two. And then we're gonna add the shrimp back into the pan and then throw everything into these dia. Okay. Cover it with foil, stick it in the oven for 10 minutes on 375. Then we're gonna top it with some chopped parsley, sesame seeds and almonds and sort of broil it for about a minute to get it nice and crispy. And then that's it. We're gonna go ahead and transfer the shrimp stew now to the zedilla. And if you don't happen to have a zedilla, feel free to use any kind of earthenware vessel. You can even divide it into small portion-sized ramekins or a casserole will also be just fine or any kind of oven-proof oven -proof bowl. And back in the day, they would actually cover it with a piece of, of dough before it was foil. So we'll tightly cover it. And we're going to stick it in the oven for about 10 minutes on 375. So I'm using some um, slivered almonds here. If you have um, blanched almonds, those work well or you know, anything really. They, sometimes they substitute pine nuts for this. Um, they can be a little bit more expensive. And you can omit the nuts too if you have a nut allergy. So I think that's good. We don't want them to burn. So I'm gonna turn off the heat. And I'm going to pour the whole thing on top of the shrimp. Probably could have used a slightly bigger zadilla, but oh well. Take this parsley, sprinkle a little bit on top. Some nice color, and we're gonna stick the whole thing back in the oven for a couple of minutes now. Both of these dishes kind of showcase the use of the zadilla, the clay bowl or mortar that is very basically ubiquitous uh, throughout the Gaza Strip. Uh, and what I love about both of them is they're very simple, they come together really quickly, they don't make a huge mess, they're kind of one, one bowl meals. And they really showcase, again, the culinary traditions of the Gaza Strip in Palestine. They're an important part of the heritage uh, and the culture, and they tell a very unique story, I would say. So I really hope you enjoyed watching, and I really hope that you try to make both of these dishes that are an important part of our heritage and culture. And again, as I always like to say, it's some food for thought and food tells a story. So share these stories with your family and friends. Thank you so much.